Hi everybody, so this week we're going to talk about covariance and I also introduce the idea of a prior model. So when you have some inclination of what the variability of not only the data that you've measured but the model parameters you're trying to estimate, that will go into the covariance of the uh, data and covariance of the model itself. And then the model prior is basically some estimate or some guess that you have of what the model is beforehand. So typically we, we have some kind of inclination, some idea of what model parameters we're going to estimate, but we might not know the specific details and the specific details are the, the things that matter. So first of all, I'd just like to say, you know, what is covariance? So we care about it. We know why we care about it is because uh, it includes some of the prior knowledge that we might have, and it can also link and associate data points and model parameters to one another. But how does it do that? So essentially a covariance is just how something varies with respect to something else. So for instance, if we go back to the first week's video that we had and we looked at the height and weight of Olympic athletes, we could see that as the height varied from the mean, it went up from the mean, so did the weight. And as the height went down from the mean, so did the weight. So we can see that you know as the height varied, so did the weight. And they both increased or they both decreased. So we said that's a positive covariance. And you might be saying to yourself, well, James, isn't that a correlation? And you'd be correct. So correlation is basically just a normalized uh, covariance. So it actually has some weight to it. So it's normalized between minus one and one. So you can always tell how strong that covariance is. Whereas if it's not normalized, it really depends on the actual values you're looking at. So the covariance um, model and data matrices, they basically have a diagonal term, which is the actual variance. So how a particular data point or a particular model parameter can vary. So we basically assume that there's a Gaussian function around some mean specified by the model parameter. So we would have some estimate of the model parameter afterwards, and that would be our a posteriori model estimate. And beforehand, we can have this prior model, and that would be our a priori uh, mean. And then the model covariance matrix will give us what we think the distribution of those values are and how they interrelate to one another. So we can put that into the data. So typically, we'd only have the diagonal term, and that would just be errors on each individual measurement. But the model um, covariance, we can actually have some kind of structure in there. So we're going to walk through a bit of the calculations on how we actually put this in the framework that we've seen and it's very very simple and in fact we'll show that under a certain circumstance then it actually boils back down to what we thought of as ticking off regularization and in fact we can think of ticking off regularization as just a specific subset of a specific covariance matrices so let's crack on with the maths so we're going to define a covariance matrix here c of some parameter x, so this could be the model or the data. So it's a matrices, and for each individual element, each ij, we're going to say that that's just the covariance of the ith element with the jth element that you can see here. Expanding upon that, we can define the covariance between any parameters a and b. Uh, through this equation, I'm not going to read it out to you, but the a bar and b bar here are the averages. So you can see, as we mentioned in the introduction, it's basically a measure of how far some value deviates from its mean and how that relates to some other parameter moving away from its mean. So we can see here that if AI moves away from the mean A bar at the same time that B of I, B of I moves away from its mean, then they're both going to be large values, so they're multiplied together to be large values, and then when you sum all of those together, you get a large covariance. Now, if one moves up whilst the other moves down, then you would get a large negative covariance. Now, one thing to note here is that you can see that it doesn't really matter which way around that A and B are. And this is you know, intuitive, the covariance of uh, parameter A with parameter B should be the same as the covariance of parameter B with parameter A. So essentially the transpose of this matrix is itself. So that's going to be very useful when we come to deriving some of the equations later on. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually replace those L2 norms with a slightly different version of an L2 norm. So it's an L2 norm under the assumption of a certain covariance matrices. So you can see the formulation here 
It's basically the exact same that we've seen before, apart from there's this covariance matrix in the middle. And we can see that it's actually a, an inverse covariance matrix. So that's uh, important to, to, to outline that, for instance, if it's a, a data covariance matrix and we just have these diagonal elements, then instead of having the, the variance on the diagonal, it'll actually be one over that. So we can see here that the covariance matrix sees they don't depend on the model parameters. So when we do the partial derivative of this cost function that we'll define with respect to the model parameters, then it won't change any of the derivation other than we'll have to take care of where we um, move around these covariance terms. So here's our new cost function. It looks very similar to what we've seen before, of course. The added term here, we can see it in a similar light to the regularization we had before. But here we've got the actual model and taking away from that is some prior model. So here, instead of like when we had the ticking off regularization, we just had the model parameters and we said basically we want them to be as small as possible because if it was a large model parameter, it would add to the cost. Here we're saying if the model is further away from the prior assumption of what the model parameters are, then it incurs a large cost. So this is forcing the model to what our prior assumption of it should be. And of course you can see the little subscript M, which means it's subject to some covariance as well. I'm not gonna walk you through how to derive the model parameters from um, that cost function in a least squared sense, because it's very similar to the maths we've seen before. And in fact, you can see that if this data covariance, this uh, CY is the identity matrix, it's basically one, and this model covariance matrix is it's the exact same value for every model parameter then that's the identity matrix multiplied by a certain value so in that instance when we don't have a model prior then that just is the exact same formulation as the ticking off regularization we've had before so we can see that the ticking off regularization we had before is kind of a special instance of of this um, it's not really how it's meant to be defined because you define a ticking off regularization simply because you have no prior information so you can't build this model covariance matrix. But it ends up being a similar, similar formulation anyway. So it's important to reiterate that especially in the case of this model covariance matrices that it's the prior belief that we have in the system, some prior knowledge that we have. So when we have a, a prior model, M prior here that we've called it, and this uh, covariance matrices for the model parameters, it's saying that before we do the inversion, we have some expectation that it, the model parameters kind of follow a Gaussian distribution and they've got some mean that's M prior and then some variation, some variance, which is given by this um, covariance matrices for the models. After we've run the inversion, we have a new mean for the model parameters, M, that we've estimated, but we also have a new variance. And this we can kind of call a, a C tilde M. So it's the a posteriori covariance of the model parameters. So we had some prior belief of what the variance of these things were, these parameters were, and then afterwards, some of them may have been more uh, better resolved. So actually the the diagonals and the off diagonal elements of this covariance matrices can change and it can give us a lot of very valuable information about how we should trust those estimated model parameters. So I've just stuck the formulation up on the screen and as you can see it's actually that inverted matrix that we have that we um, need is to estimate the model parameters so it's not something that we don't already have as part of the inversion um, process that we're doing at the moment. So I hope you found that enlightening and interesting. And next week, what we're going to do is actually something interesting. We're going to say that what we've done so far, or the way we've approached solving the problems, is not necessarily the correct way of doing it. So we're actually going to look at how you implement these inverse theory problems in practice. So I know that we've got a couple of, of practicals at the moment, but we're going to see how you would actually do it in a production setting. So typically you wouldn't solve by inverting a matrix, you would actually solve by solving the normal equations. And we'll cover all of that next week. So we're going to introduce a few new packages. We might not use NumPy, we might use SciPy and move over to there. So look forward to that. If you like the video, thumbs up, like and subscribe. And thanks for watching.